evening and welcome and uh, to the seventh online anesthesiology session from uh, the HCP Forum and Kolkata Anesthesia Academy. Uh, it's been a huge learning experience over the last month, a uh, couple of months, I must say, ever since the pandemic uh, set in. But uh, we have been trying to we have tried to figure out how we can continue with our teaching and training. So this essentially, uh, if I can kind of say that this essentially started off as the the alternative to the face-to-face -face classes that we used to have for our DNB anesthesia program at Apollo Glenagles Hospitals. And, uh, yeah. And slowly we have evolved uh, and we have been lucky to have associated ourselves with uh, the HCP forum, which is very ably laid by Dr. Jayati. And uh, thanks to her cooperation that we have kind of gone ahead and made this into a more elaborate forum. And this is our uh, seventh uh, online anesthesiology kind of a program. Uh, to begin with, uh, this obviously, we thought that this was a session that would be primarily targeting or towards the postgraduate students, whether they are doing a diploma in anesthesiology or an MD in anesthesiology or a DNB in anesthesiology. Essentially, as I said, it was initially started off uh, looking forward towards our students at Apollo Glen Eagles. And then I, I suppose a lot more people started joining in. And uh, then we also realized that it's not only of interest for uh, the students, it's also of interest for people who practice anesthesia. So today we have we have we have over 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 the last seven we have done things which are of common interest things like uh, uh, diabetes and uh, management during anesthesia the uh, pulmonary physiology uh, the aspects of uh, thoracic anesthesia then we dealt with uh, enhanced recovery after surgery surgery because we thought that is a kind of a, a a template which wherein people can figure out how to approach anything when you are asked whether in the exam or you are faced with a practical scenario we have de dealt with uh, then we we thought we will do a series on preoperative evaluation so we had uh, an extensive one on uh, pulmonary evaluation prior to non thoracic surgery then we did a risk assessment for cardiac evaluation coming in patients coming in for non-cardiac surgery uh, we also had things which are uh, extremely important for day-to-day -day practice plus for exams like things like the basics of ecg chest x-rays pulmonary function tests cardiopulmonary exercise testing yeah, we had things a little elaborate on uh, basics of neonatal anesthesia and then we also went a little further and looked at what anesthetics does to the developing brain. So having done all that uh, today, uh, we will discuss the something which I think uh, anesthesiologists are becoming very aware of its potential of use and that is echocardiography. So we initially thought that uh, this is the domain of cardiologists echocardiography and then while uh, the maybe 15 years or a little earlier than that maybe 15 20 years back we realized in cardiac anesthesia that uh, you cannot do cardiac anesthesia if you don't know the basics or possibly even advanced uh, echocardiography and today i'm proud to say that uh, some cardiac anesthesia or rather most cardiac anesthesiologists interpret or do echocardiography especially trans thoracic echocardiography, echocardiography far better than many cardiologists do because they're more interested in intervention anyway so what we will and but we also realize that uh, echocardiography is now not only 
useful for cardiac anesthesiologists, but also for general anesthesiologists. There's, there are huge areas in non-cardiac surgery, uh, prior to surgery, during surgery, after surgery, where uh, the echocardiographic plays a huge role. And uh, to deal with that, we have with us uh, Dr. Dibbendu Khan. Uh, Dibbendu is a very, very close friend of mine, a very close colleague of mine. We have been working together for a Quite some time now at Apollo Glen Eagles Hospitals, he kind of masterminds the cardiac anesthesia program at Apollo Glen Eagles. Uh, he is an alumnus of one of the very reputed medical institutions of this country, Christian Medical College Velour, from where he did his MBBS and MD. And he's been in cardiac anesthesia for many, many years, a hugely experienced, vastly skilled, very, very knowledgeable. And uh, now I would ask the Bindu to talk about echocardiography, the basics and beyond, and which is useful for everyone, everyone, not only for cardiac anesthesiologists, but again. So the Bindu, I would request you to take over so you can share the screen and uh, the stage is yours. Thank you, sir, for a wonderful introduction. Good evening, all and everybody. And I thank also the HCP Forum and Kolkata Anesthesia Academy. So this is uh, maybe used to be our domain now, but I guess uh, in our institute in Apollo, it's not only our domain, it's also all anesthetists domain. So um, our topic, my topic for today for the discussion is echocardiography as point of care basics and beyond for all. So the first thing I like to say is if you really don't look, we don't know. And why do I say that? Say, uh, say a 21-year-old uh, student who had an RTA, he complains of severe right leg pain and uh, most commonly diagnosed as right, right femoral fracture, GCS 15 by 15, bruising marks seen over the chest and right leg. But when the anesthetist, general anesthetist take him up for a right femur fixation, his BP on monitor shows 90 by 50 and heart rate around 68. So. Uh, I guess uh, if you put up eco and uh, why this BP is not only the blood loss because there has been no obvious blood loss. So if you put in an eco probe, we get to see this. So, uh, so that's a huge pericardial tamponade. We can see a tamponade around the heart and also there is an RV dilatation. So if someone sees this before uh, taking him for anesthesia at uh, uh, in the OT, then the whole anesthetic management changes. So that's why we ECO has been considered as a point of care ultrasound examination. And it's been performed at the patient's bedside and specifically very useful in acute clinical situations to aid in making a diagnosis or providing a qualitative assessment of a patient. Now, why do I say that? There has been also proved in recently in 2014 in Anesthesia Journal, a review article was published and it shows that a review of echocardiography in anesthesia and perioperative practice, its impact and utility. It was published by one of the registrars and uh, intensivists in a uh, UK uh, hospital. And what they did was they looked into all uh, a lot of studies and what they found is like, say, Canty et al. They'd, observational prospective study of transthoracic echo in 100 patients who were posted for non-cardiac patients. And they found that when you're doing transthoracic echo, they had plan of management was changed in 54% of their changes. They had to either step up or step down in monitoring or in even the usage of drugs or plan of anesthesia. And what they did was mainly focus scan was done. So you, we, we don't really need to do uh, extensive echocardiography for all patients as anesthetist, not only as cardiac anesthetist, as any anesthetist, we should be having aware of this basic echocardiography because this is one of the tools or rather the pleasant uh, eyes of anesthesia. We can actually change the whole plan. Even same study showed by Kawe, who we also showed that same prospective study done in transthoracic echo for 170 non-cardiac surgery patient. There was significant change in management around 82% and also change in monitoring, like we may have to go for invasive monitoring instead of non-invasive. And the, the same measurement like a focus scan was done pre-anesthesia. Even 
Schulmeier also showed that uh, prospective observational study they performed in uh, 42 patients who uh, were in posted for non cardiac surgery what they did was they did a trans esophageal echo now there is a difference that i uh, would like to say a trans esophageal echo is a invasive procedure though you really need a bit more expertise and you need more experience but it's that doesn't mean that a general anesthetist cannot perform you don't need to always have cardiac anesthetist around and this is a much more better tool but only constraint is you need with you need more expertise and more number of patients you might be having practice over that similarly hofer et al also proved that toe in for uh, non cardiac surgery elective patients they had changes in plan so all these studies what they found and showed that echocardiography is a plan changer and especially in acute conditions obviously in any emergency scenario or any doubtful scenario whether also patients posted in elective cardiac elective non cardiac surgery we should also if the if you think that there is something wrong and you suspect we we may have a we should have a knowledge of trans thoracic echo and if you are able to do some basic screening we may get lot of knowledge and we may actually give a better outcome in this era for the all the patients so uh, why trans thoracic echo in an unstable mainly to identify the hypovolemia the volume status which we are very much uh, which as anesthetic we should be very aware of it or we should be we are always dealing with it there is something always a, a component of cardiac tamponade in road traffic accident they may sometimes always not present with hemodynamic instability they may be an impending cardiac tamponade which usually is uh, presented more often after anesthetizing so is like a case which i presented if if we couldn't have if the bp was normal say around 120 by 80 and uh, uh, obviously we wouldn't have done an echo i think most of our anesthesia plan could have been just to go ahead with the spinal but if you and obviously after seeing this echo i would rather not go for a spinal anesthesia so that's how is the echo cardiography a game changer in this and it also helps in post operative outcome and a safety for both uh, for the patients and also for our outcome like new things like left ventricular and right ventricular failure should also be ruled out which is also very seen very commonly in patients who are uh, more towards the older patients who are chronic smokers even young patients say around 40 to 50 years of uh, age patients who are posted for uh, non cardiac surgery who are uh, chronic smokers they do have underlying hypertension so uh, chronic pulmonary hypertension which can be precipitated if you are not uh, during anesthesia if you are not able to identify pre op pre uh, perioperative period and obviously something uh, called severe valvulopathies most commonly seen in our uh, uh, in india is uh, a severe mitral regurgitation which is most common reason in our belt is rheumatic heart disease which is very much prevalent in india so we may not have always a, a pan systolic murmur with a thrill in all the patients you auscultate so auscultation is very important but if you do suspect or if patients do give some history of dyspnea on exertion sometime during the past and if you have an echocardiography probe uh, beside you it's always better to go for it and just to rule out any severe valvulopathies because a severe mr or a severe aortic regurgitations which are very much or can be also predominant in uh, patients who have marfanoid features so will be a game changer or it will change a plan of anesthesia now what are the advantages of doing a trans thoracic it is fast and very immediate results we do get to understand and it's a non invasive exam so that's very uh, easier for us whereas a trans esophageal echo is an invasive so you, we have to know the consequences and the contraindications for it which i'll be dealing later in the slides and the dynamic assessments commonly the heart movements the valvular movements and as a whole the volume status is usually identified and we can also do a serial monitoring so you do a monitoring not a serially means uh, pre anesthesia and also towards the post surgery before shifting the patient to the ward so actually you can also post operatively before shifting the patient to uh, immediate post uh, uh, post op care center whether you really want to shift the patient to the ward or to an hdu or to icu so all that uh, can be changed by doing just an echocardiography which we can help you to identify all the uh, volume status whether the patient is doing well any underlying heart conditions whether he needs continuous monitoring 
So all these things are uh, helpful and which can be easily identified by this transthoracic echo. Now, the disadvantages of this is it's a highly user dependent. So obviously, if I am doing a transthoracic echo every day in at least one patient and someone who is doing transthoracic echo once in a week, so obviously the difference of user dependent because the, I, the more you get used to it, the more you actually know about it. So if you don't look, you don't let, get to learn. So if in our institute, like in Apollo, we all our anesthetists, whenever they get a chance, they always just practice. Even in post-operative period, they put the transthoracic echo probe on the pa uh, patients and just they try to uh, uh, see how the heart is or even if they suspect. So the more you see, the more it is easier and does not provide quantitative analysis because quantitative analysis requires more uh, better views and it requires a lot of measurements, which we don't recommend for any anesthetist or neither we are much interested in doing it because it's a short time uh, examination procedure. Now, just a bit of history about how does ultrasound came and how it uh, won about into this transthoracic and TOE. The early developments, first the time uh, uh, eco was, the word eco was coined by Marcus Vitrus in 18 to 50 BC. And then Lazaro Spallanzi in 1727 to 1719, he was known as the father of ultrasound. He demonstrated that bats navigated by eco reflection. And Christian Doppler uh, in 1842, he described the Doppler effect. And that was one of the game changer. That's Doppler effect uh, in echo is one which identifies the blood movements across the heart chambers. So movement across not only the heart chambers, even in bigger vessels and any blood flow seen through the vessels is easily identified because of this Doppler effect when the, if he developed this in the echo. And later, uh, so uh, Paul Lagenwin developed the Snowder, which was used the piezoelectric effect to develop transmitters and receivers. So why he was also uh, one of the game changers? Because piezoelectric crystals are used for in the present day ultrasound, which gives phased array. And that's how uh, easily an ultrasound image and a better ultrasound image, faster image, and uh, all the three components like A mode, the B mode, and the M mode, the motion mode, of all the three modes of basic ultrasound are combined together in a single machine and can be easily identified to help us to identify the different uh, features of the heart we are looking for. And coming into the history of some uh, uh, history of medical use of ultrasound and clinical echo, and uh, one of the uh, patients, uh, the people who were the game changer again were uh, Ing Edler and Helmuth Hertz in 1953 who developed the coin or rather he collaborated the use of ultrasonoscope to examine the heart and beginning of the clinical echocardiography and later a lot of people have idea totally slowly advanced the use of ultrasound like Fagenbegin he initiated the clinical study of cardiac ultrasound and the phased array ultrasound was later developed and soon uh, after that color flow droppler and M mode by Brandon Steeny from Switzerland also developed the mode, which again further evaluated the heart and vessels in a better way. So it helps us to identify more easier way of uh, more abnormalities. And this per, these two people, Edler and uh, C.H. Hertz in 1979, were the first uh, people to identify the M-mode echocardiography of the heart in 1953. And they are known as the fathers of clinical echocardiography. Now, what are the equipments we really require for doing an echo? We need a machine. There has to be a transducer, which is at present a phased array probe. And obviously, you need a medium between the surface. That is, a gel is usually preferred. Sometimes in sterile procedures, when we are doing, like if you are using an ultrasound for invasive lines, so we can use either jelly or also you can use betadine or clean saline under uh, sterile ribs as also a medium. Coming to some basic physics, so, so since we are calling it an ultrasound, mainly the sound is a mechanical vibration which is transmitted through an elastic medium. And we all know that human hearing is between 16 to 16 mega kilohertz hearing. And what we are talking about the ultrasound is all about 2 to 2 megahertz to 10 megahertz. The higher frequency range is used for ultrasound above. Now. What are the characteristics of ultrasound waves which are used for uh, demonstrating or in echo machine? 
these are mainly they follow the principle of mechanical vibration that induce alternate reductions and compressions on their passage through any physical medium so we are trying to evaluate all uh, any medium which it is passing through and the deflection of these waves actually at a uh, been projected as an image which we are able to identify the different structures coming to frequency the word frequency we need to know the number of cycles per second the waves are going emitted from the probe to the medium to the structure we are trying to identify and again it's coming back the wavelength we talk about is the distance between the cycles the amplitude is the extension of cycles or the loudness which has been demonstrated by decibels coming as an ultrasound propagation velocity and the carrying medium as you can see in different medium the uh, ultrasound propagation velocity varies like in air it is 30, 330 uh, meter per second whereas in blood it is 1560 in muscle 1580 fat it is 1450 so in average propagation velocity of ultrasound in more often in the soft tissue is around 1540 uh, meter per second and now why is wavelength important for this ultrasound diagnostic because we need to get a better resolution whatever we are trying to see through non invasively via this ultrasound we need to get a better resolution so shorter the image the higher the resolution be and the depth of penetration is proportional to the wavelength so why what is the depth of penetration so we wherever this trans thoracic echo that means we are putting the probe over the thorax so we are trying to visualize anything uh, uh, under the thorax inside the thorax that is the heart the lungs and the pleural space so the depth of penetration we are talking about from that uh, so how well these waves are penetrated to identify the structures underneath is inversely related to the frequency so short waves travel shorter distance long waves travel longer distance so you need to for have better depth of penetration you need to have a, a low frequency and a higher wavelength uh, of waves to get a better resolution and better depth of penetration now this is just a diagrammatic representation of how the ultrasound waves work so that you can see the on the length of propagation we get rarefaction and compression in when the wave form travels through the medium now echocardiography uses this ultrasound to create real time images both the two dimensional and the m mode imaging are used for obtaining the anatomical information so the anatomical information what we are more uh, concerned about is the heart from the transthoracic the lungs and the pleura now the added things which can be added to this echo is a doppler and a color flow imaging which are very much uh, useful for information on the blood flow across this uh, structures so in a heart we get to if you try to put a doppler in a color flow we try to see any valvular pathologies are there so if you get a severe mitral regurgitation you see the blood flow going abnormally in a say from usually the blood flows from left atrium into the left ventricle when you put a, a doppler or a color flow imaging in, across a mitral valve in a patient with severe mr you get to see a abnormal blood flow that is via the looking as if the image looks like a mosaic pattern of blood flow because of this color flow imaging and piezoelectric elements which emit the ultrasonic waves are partially refracted back from layers of different tissue densities this is one thing we need to remember and that's what the element is used nowadays in most of the probes so what are the main basic three modes is the a mode the b mode a mode is mainly the amplitude it is talking about the b mode it detects the brightness of the structures or the underlying structures we are trying to identify and the motion m mode is the m mode of the anatomical structure so what is the m mode motion means when we are trying to see the motion of the wall say in when we are visualizing the heart and we uh, the phased array pro uh, rays which are cutting across the heart structures if if we put in in m mode we get to identify the motion of the heart wall so any abnormality in the heart wall uh, movements so that's what it identifies the any left ventricular motion abnormality which is very much important whether we have any diff developmental uh, whether any dif uh, difficulty in motion wall abnormality which is which can be a game changer or a plan changer for inducing anesthesia for any patients cardiac ultrasound comprises of the three main components the transducer the display the recording unit the echocardiography unit the main component consists of the phased array of 
which is emitted by the piezoelectric crystals up to 128 is used for 2d probe and 2500 for a 3d probe frequency of the trans thoracic eco probe adult is around 2.5 to 3.5 megahertz whereas for a pediatric it is around 7 to 12 megahertz most trans uh, trans esophageal eco probes they uh, uses between 3.5 to 7.5 megahertz now this is the schematic diagram of the transistor which it looks like this is a schematic of the trans thoracic eco it's got a lens and a cover plate at the most outer surface then the matching layers and the in between the matching layers the piezoelectric crystal are inserted and you got an electrodes which helps in transmitting this movement of the piezoelectric crystal which actually discharges or charges according to the rarefaction and that's how the electrical energy is transmitted to a uh, sound energy and further after getting the reflection of the ultrasound then uh, the sound energy is transmitted further uh, converted into electrical energy and via cable it is sent to the monitor where it is displayed into the monitor so this is how it works so if you see uh, on applying current to the piezoelectric crystal the changes of the all the ions and anions and the transducer generates ultrasound energy and that's how it ref, uh, passes through the structures and on after reflection when it comes back and the sounds are received by this probe then the deformity in the mechanically which is seen and the uh, in the, between the piezoelectric crystals are transmitted again converted to electrical energy which is further been sent through the cable and to the monitor unit and is displayed and that's how we get to see the the structures so the returning signals after having linear amplification and uh, time gain compensation envelope detection radio vi uh, polar video signaling digital scan converter and where after post processing with the proper video signaling and that's how at the end result is what we get to see an image of the structures we are trying to look for so this is as a whole in general the how the intricacy of the ultrasound probe and what all it happens in inside now why do we need to actually have uh, this trans thoracic eco in all patients or we try to should be having mainly uh, the established risk factors for post-op mortality is uh, very much identified or easily identified if we manage to do in high risk patients who are coming for non-cardiac surgery like as we discussed in any polytrauma or suspected uh, patients who are coming for elective surgeries. So what are the most risk factors which we can defer? Any systolic dysfunction, regional wall motion abnormality in the heart, underlying any valvular heart disease like severe aortic stenosis, mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation, where most of the patients can be asymptomatic or they may have very one or two symptoms quite uh, in, uh, in a uh, lengthier gap so you may not actually pick up a proper uh, history of the cardiac symptoms patients with underlying diastolic failure if the volume status of the patient can also have the post-op uh, may lead on to the post-op mortality severe lvh is another component which should be also identified which helps in uh, uh, which helps in the post-op mortality or a which uh, actually uh, the mortality has been uh, it, uh, pro it propagates the post-operative mortality. And lastly, lastly, the large and the gross visible intracardiac masses. This is very much common in patients. Like if we get a patient who also have a use of drug abuse, so very commonly seen is a tricuspid vegetation. So that should not also be ruled out. Or any patients who had history of TI or recurrent syncope and young patient, or a patients, if you see a C, uh, on, on putting the patient on monitor, you get to see atrial fibrillation and young patient, we should always look for uh, severe MS and an underlying any LA thrombus, left atrial thrombus should not be missed out. So that's also, it helps in post-operative managing the intraoperative management and prediction of the post-op mortality. Poor, uh, other things which also should be ruled out are poor global LV dysfunction. Uh, underlying any patients who have adult is undiagnosed most commonly is a patent ferrum oval which is easily missed out pericardial diseases diastolic dysfunction uh, hemo or pneumothorax in a trauma patients plural effusion so patients with breathing difficulty and uh, you are suspecting any bruise marks over the chest but no breathing difficulty but a drop in saturation you should also go for to rule out any hemo or pneumothorax 
pericardial effusion again and patients diagnosing or confirming the diagnosis of cardiogenic shock also helps is helped out by this use of eco now just to brush through what all we can do and how easily we can do a trans thoracic eco so this is a more of a web platform but i will try to uh, make it more easier for you so just we will be discussing the three main windows which is more useful for anesthetists uh, to grossly evaluate what all been discussing and what we can rule out which we can help in the post operative outcome the first window is the parasternal window we just place uh, next to the sternum then a uh, second window for a trans thoracic examination is an apical window and the third and very commonly used to identify the volume status is also a subcostal window so uh, whenever we are seeing a heart or a cardiac structures through a trans thoracic we need to know what is a long axis and a short axis plane this is a diagram which shows when we see the heart across a longitudinal section it is more of a long axis plane and we see a cut section or uh, 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 we get to see the short axis plane now some transducer terminology the movement of the probes are usually superior inferior lateral or medial tilting of the probe also can be superiorly inferiorly anteriorly and posteriorly the probe can be angulated more medial and lateral rotation of the probe and also we should have a knowledge about the image index marker so this is the first thing if the patient is away you get and you have time and the patient is cooperative so you can ask the patient to turn to the patient's left side uh, uh, and so that you have it uh, so patients are on the left side so the heart is tilted more anteriorly and uh, to the towards the chest cavity and that's more useful to identify the parasternal and apical views for a subcostal view you can keep the patient in supine position and if he is awake and cooperative you can ask the patient to uh, fold their knees so that the abdomen is well relaxed and during and the probe is inserted in when the patient is in end expiration so you get to insert the probe comfortably just below the zephy sternum and the suprasternal view can also mainly to identify any uh, abnormalities in the aorta now coming to parasternal long axis view we see the patient is positioned left lateral transducer is placed at the left sternal is third and fourth intercostal space the indicator of the trans thoracic probe should be directed towards the patient's right shoulder and what we get to visualize is the structures which are visualized are are the you can see it's a longitudinal cross section on the right side the echocardiography view we can see the right ventricular outflow tract the interventricular septum the aortic valve the left ventricle and the inflow tract the left atrium with the mitral valve is seen so that's how you get to see a cross section of most of the structures in this view and you get to assess of most of like the mitral valve and the aortic valve and also the right ventricle and the left ventricle grossly is identified now assessment uh, what we said is the left ventricular size and function rv size and function interventricular septum any septal rupture ascending aorta aortic valve mitral valve and also pericardium is assessed to rule out any presence of effusion now parasternal short axis how we get we place the probe in the same place just by turning the marker dot from the right shoulder 90 degrees towards the left shoulder patient's left shoulder and by tilting on the axis between the left hip and the right shoulder short axis views are obtained at different level say from the aortic up to the lv apex like uh, and in the parasternal short axis view we get to see three views when we tilt the transducer from the right shoulder or the head towards the feet that is the aortic valve mitral valve view and the mid papillary view in the aortic valve view we get to see a structures like this where we assess the aortic valve in an end on view and you get to see the right ventricular inflow outflow tract you can see the right atrium tricuspid valve and the right ventricular outflow tract and the left atrium is also well assessed in the mitral valve view when you tilt the probe more towards the foot patient's foot from a head end to foot region you get to see a cross section of the lv and the rv so this is an end on view like where you get to see the mitral valve uh, cross sectional fish mouth appearance the whole circumferential view of the left ventricle is seen and also the right ventricle is well assessed this is one of the commonest view where you can assess any regional wall motion abnormality of the heart or the left ventricle and the mid ventricular view you further tilt it more towards the foot 
you get to see the mid papillary view where instead of the valve you get to see the papillary muscles of the mitral valve and again the circumferential distribution of the wall the anterior lateral inferior and the septal left ventricular wall is seen and also you can assess the pericardial across so what all we can see in assess a parasternal short axis view it helps to assess the left ventricle right ventricle both size and function aortic valve mitral valve and presence of any wall motion abnormalities now how do we manage to see the apical four chamber view this is another very common view we can use transducer is positioned at the apex of the heart and the indicator uh, indicator of the transducer is pointed towards the left of the patient's shoulder and what we get to see is we get to see from the apex as if we are looking from uh, the apex towards the upper end of the heart so we get to see from the tip of the probe uh, we get to the uh, structures which are nearer the probe are the right ventricle and the left ventricle and the farther away from the probe is the right atrium and the left atrium and the interventricular valves which are present so in this four chamber view assessment of left ventricle and left atrium is seen the right ventricle and the right atrium is also assessed the aortic valve mitral valve and also the tricuspid valve the aortic valve is seen when you tilt it a bit more clockwise to get an five chamber view i don't think we need to really stress on this uh, as an anesthetist for uh, to assess because we can assess the aortic valve in the previous uh, view as we discussed the apical two chamber view is achieved by placing the probe again in the apex but only thing is turning the indicator of the probe from the anti clockwise towards the left side of the neck so you are turning the probe from the right side of the uh, left side of the shoulder towards the left side of the neck uh, anti clockwise so there we get to see the two chamber view and what are the two chambers we get to look at again the closer to the probe is the left ventricle and we get to see the wall, mainly the two common walls are anterior and the inferior wall and the farther to the probe is seen the left atrium and coming to this is a very commonest view and which i think as anesthetist we should always use this view as the first because this is very commonly used to identify the volume status this is placed under the zephy sternum the indicator is pointed towards the indicator on the probe is pointed towards the patient's left shoulder and the subject lies supine with slightly head low if possible and the knees slightly elevated if the patient is cooperative now what we get to see there are two views you actually can see the heart by keeping the probe more towards the right side so we get to see the right ventricle and the left ventricle uh, towards near the probe and the farthest structures are the right atrium and the left atrium now this is the common thing which we we should be able to identify is the subcostal great vessel view so what are the great vessel we are trying to look mainly is the ivc and sometimes also the aorta so how do we manage to get this view is by rotating the probe from the same zephy sternal view towards the uh, head by a 12 o'clock position and we actually get to see the inferior vena cava and the abdominal aorta now in the left side of the diagram you see how we get to see the inferior vena cava the hepatic vein and the ivc draining into the right atrium this is very commonly used in spontaneously breathing patient to identify the volume status so whether the patient's ivc is collapsing with inspiration or expiration and so if the collapsibility is more than 50% you know the patient is hypovolemic or if it's collapse or rather the kissing sign if the ivc walls are kissing to each other that means the patient is severely hypovolemic and if there is in a spontaneously breathing patient there is no much of difference on uh, inspiration and expiration then you know the volume status can be adequate or can be overloaded so and it also measures the uh, what do the ivc view can also be what we do is by we can measure the diameter which is normally around 2 to 3 cm and we need to measure it inferior from the ivc ra junction around 2 to 3 cm and in a spontaneously ventilating patient as i was telling ki an ivc collapsibility of more than 50% is a very predictive of a low ra pressure which is approximately less than 10 mm so you know the patient is uh, hypovolemic now the crux is in this is if you have a patient who is already mechanically ventilated then you get to have a, a false positive or a false a false positive results by using this view the ivc respiratory variation is a though is a good predictor of pre roll responsiveness but in a mechanical ventilated patient it's a doubtful thing so what we can suggest is if the patient is ventilated say in an icu if you have a patient and you are trying to identify the volume status by using this view when you are in i posted in icu or we are seeing any patient who is 
ICU, then what we can uh, though uh, practically we can be done, we can disconnect the ventilator for a, a moment and we can identify the collapsibility of the IVC. So if the we can grossly identify whether the patient is severely uh, hypovolemic, if the both the walls of the IVC are collapsing or the patient is adequately loaded when there is non-collapse. That's all we can identify in a mechanically ventilated patient after disconnecting from the ventilation for a few moments. Now coming to a more better uh, imaging technique is a trans esophageal echocardiography. This is the principles are always all the same, but only thing is it's an invasive. The probe is placed in the esophagus and we are actually looking very uh, close to the heart because the probe is just in the esophagus. Anatomically, it is just uh, esophagus is just posterior to the heart. And the, so the probe, we are just very, very much close to the heart and we get to see the structures much more clearer and we get much more better views in this mode of imaging. So that's why trans esophageal eco, if you are used to it, it's always and the availability of the probe, if you are available in any sick patients, we can always go ahead and do a trans esophageal echo. It's a more diagnostic and monitoring imaging tool, which is widely used, uh, widespread application in operating an ICU. Though it's a semi-invasive monitoring and diagnostic tool, but used in uh, perioperative management of mainly cardiac surgery, but I would rather surgery availability and expertise are there. In hemodynamically unstable patient, it will give much more better information than a trans thoracic echo. And it should be performed by a trained uh, echocardiographer. Now, what are the more common views we, which we look for is uh, upper esophageal uh, view, which is uh, usually uh, seen between 20 to 25 centimeter from the incisor. Uh, mid esophageal, when the probe or the tip of the probe where the electric uh, the array or array, phased array is emitted should be placed between 30 to 40 centimeter from the incisors. And when the probe is placed in the stomach and we are looking from the stomach, we are actually looking into the heart from the stomach. It's called transgastric view which is usually the level is around 40, beyond or around 40 centimeter from the level of the incisors. So this is how we get to see a schematic diagram where the upper esophageal, mid esophageal and transgastric, how the phased arrow from a trans esophageal echo cuts across all the structures related from behind the heart and we get to see much what all information. So I'll be just in the next few slides, I'll try to delineate and highlight how we can actually help and uh, in this. So coming to the, uh, the grossly, what does it uh, trans esophageal echo looks? This is how an echocardiography probe looks. It's got a tip where the piezoelectric crystals are kept. And uh, that's where the main thing, we have to be very careful while inserting. Sometimes injuring, uh, even the patients can be injured while uh, insertion. And even with patients with bucking teeth, we should be very much more careful because that itself can, uh, bucking incisors can injure the probe itself and you may get erroneous result. You have a body and then the handle of the probe is there where you have control wheels and there's a wire which is connected and connect with along with a connector which connects to the monitor unit. Now components of the again the transducer is almost the same as trans thoracic eco. It's got a face plate an acoustic lens and the piezoelectric material is placed in between with the backing material. Now coming to the handle a, a, a very close view of the handle. We get to see there are main three components. There is a break. What is this break used for? When the probe is actually not used, we lock it. So anyone should not be able to move the probe because if you move the tip of the probe uh, and it may cause injury uh, to, it may get actually spoiled. So that's why the break is used so mainly to keep the probe in neutral position and no one should be able to move the probe either uh, by these wheels. So actually you're creating a break for the wheels. It's got a smaller wheel and a larger wheel Usually the larger wheel helps in uh, anti-flexing and uh, retroflexing the probe, which I'll be showing in what is what does that mean. And the smaller wheel helps in right side and left side rotation. And the array rotation buttons are the phased array which are emitted from the tip of the this trans esophageal echocardiography probe. It's uh, it, the ray can be rotated from zero to 180 degree. And that's how when it examines the heart, the different structures are seen at different angles. So that's how, uh, what all the movements are possible in a TOE. Either you can turn it to the left or it can be turned it to the right. You can push it in or you can withdraw it. The phased array can be uh, rotated from zero to 180 degrees. And with the bigger wheel, you can actually do an anti-flexion. That is pushing the, the tip of the probe can be anti-flexed 
anteriorly or retroflex posteriorly. So these are the movements uh, which are very much necessary in identifying or while we are examining the cardiac and uh, surrounding structures via transesophageal echo. We should have a knowledge about this. Now, what does the phase array orientation or the uh, DE probe orientation is? This phased array which is placed and we get to see the array phase. Uh, if you place, it orients from 0 to 180 degree. So 0 degree is where the transverse plane to the probe is in long axis. That is horizontal to the plane of the body and oblique to the cardiac short axis view. And at 45 degree, the short axis view of the cardiac structures are visible. And at 90 degrees, the phase array is 90 degree to the uh, to the T probe. And that is the parallel to the probe long axis or you, when we get to see a longitudinal plane or rather a sagittal plane to the plane of the body. And at 180 degree, it's more of a mirror image. And the 135 degree is in between 90 to 180 degree where we get to see the long axis view of the cardiac structures, mainly the uh, LV live ventricle and the late ventricle outflow tract. Now, this is what a comprehensive uh, examination is all about. Uh, if you get uh, to know to all these view, you actually go ahead with this all these 21 comprehensive examination views. We should be knowing, but I guess uh, there was an article the, that uh, how it compares and uh, rather how it compares this 20 uh, trans esophageal view with the trans thoracic eco view. So I'll be just brushing up through all the views which are comparable to the transthoracic echo view which can be easily identified. Now what are the indications of transesophageal echo? Then in category one indications with a very much for the evaluation of acute persistent and life-threatening hemodynamic instability in OR or ICU or the intraoperative use in valve repair, intraoperative use in con congenital heart surgery requiring CPB, intraoperative use during repair of a hocum, intraoperative use for endocarditis, perioperative use for suspected thoracic aortic aneurysm or dissection or disruption, assessment of the aortic valve during aortic valve dissection or aortic valve repair, and intraoperative evaluation of pericardial window procedures. Now, category two indications for performing QO is perioperative use in patients with increased risk of myocardial infarction or ischemia, in patients who are at risk of hemodynamic disturbances, intraoperative assessment again of the valve, repair of cardiac aneurysm, any patients who are undergoing thoracic aortic dissections along with valve repair or any intraoperative evaluations of anastomatic sites during heart and lung transplantation. And also while monitoring and placement of function of assist devices. The category three indications for performing a TO is mainly to intraoperative evaluation of myocardial perfusion, the coronary uh, anatomy, intraoperative use for any patients under having cardiomyopathies or hocum hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, assessment of repairs of thoracic aortic injuries, any evaluation of pleuropulmonary disease intraoperatively, and also monitoring and uh, the placement of IAVP or automated cardiac defibrillators or pulmonary artery catheters. And also now in this COVID endemic area, it's very much used for in proper placement of ECMO, which is one of the tools for patients who are having pulmonary complications post COVID. Now, since uh, it's an invasive procedure, semi-invasive, what are the contraindications? We have to have a knowledge about it. The most absolute contraindication is first is in an awake patient, uh, refusal of the patient consent, a previous patient history of esophagectomy, previous esophagogastrectomy, or any history of geriatric surgery, or suspected or actual neck injuries patient, we should try to avoid insertion of TE. Because you re, uh, while insertion of TE, you really need to manipulate the neck and also the jaw movements are required for manipulation. Relative contraindications, esophageal stricture, esophageal diverticulum, patients who are uh, pediatric group of patients where is transesophageal fistula is there, hiatus hernia, large descending thoracic aortic aneurysm. This is more of a relative, so it can be used by expertise because in all the aneurysm repair, TO is one of the most common monitoring tool and patients with unilateral vocal cord paralysis for more of medical reason, medical legal reasons, esophageal varices who are active and post radiation therapy. Now, as I was talking about what all the T views out of all the 21 comprehensive views, which I showed is very more commonly uh, or rather equal to all the T, T trans thoracic views, which can be almost same 
we should be having knowledge about is the comparative views like the prior sternal long axis view can be easily con compared to the mid esophageal long axis view where the left atrium mitral valve left ventricle left ventricular outflow tract and the aortic valve is assessed but, uh, like in transesophageal the transgastric basal mid and apical short axis view is more similar to the assessment in the transthoracic e coli as we see in parasternal basal mid and apical short axis view where the right ventricle mitral valve and the left ventricle is assessed in mid esophageal uh, right ventricular inflow outflow tract in a te view is more commonly same as the parasternal short axis view where all the right ventricle tricuspid right atrium pulmonary valve right ventricular outflow tract and the aortic valve is visualized and the more commonly apical four chamber and the apical two chamber seen in transthoracic view is easily observed in te with a mid esophageal four chamber and mid esophageal two chamber view now how do we manage to get the mid esophageal four chamber view the transducer is placed in the mid esophagus behind the the left atrium in the esophagus you know the phased arrow a phased array of the emission of the rays are between kept between 0 to 10 degrees here what we get to see is just the opposite since the probe is placed behind the uh, heart it is in the esophagus we are actually observing the heart very closely the nearer structures are the one which are more closer to the esophagus so the posterior more structures are nearer to the tip of the probe so the left atrium and the right atrium is more seen nearer to the probe and the farther to the probe is seen the left ventricle and the right ventricle this is just an opposite view of what we get to see in the uh, mid uh, four chamber apical view so if we uh, this is a live eco videography this is how what we get to see you can see the mitral valve left atrium on the left ventricle and also the right ventricle in the mid esophageal two chamber view the uh, position of the probe is same again in the esophagus but only thing the omniplane of the phased array is changed from 0 to 10 where to up to 80 to 100 degrees and here we are assessing only the two chambers the left atrium and the left ventricle and also the left atrial appendage why we need to identify the left atrial appendage is more commonly to rule out any patients who are underlying atrial fibrillation with uh, presence of LA thrombus because that will change the whole post-operative management also and sometimes in dilated coronary sinus you can see a very well informative in mid esophageal long axis view here the probe, probe is again in the esophagus only thing the omniplane of the phase array is changed from 100 and it's gone beyond to 120 to 110 uh, 140 degrees and here you get to see the most commonly the left atrium and the left ventricular outflow tract that is the most commonly assessed structure and also the right ventricle and the right ventricular outflow tract so this is how the li live video shows and uh, you get to see the mitral valve and the aortic valve in the same view along with the right ventricle now the transgastric views are the most common views which are best for evaluating the left and the right ventricle both functioning and also the volume status is more commonly seen and any uh, it helps in also assessing the ejection fraction and wall motion abnormality and it also identify accurately the gradients of the aortic valve as and to degree uh, to assess the degree of aortic stenosis or aortic regurgitation with patients in like marfonide patients in transgastric basal short axis view when the probe is actually placed in the stomach and you get to see uh, the we are actually seeing from the stomach so we are trying to look the heart from below and the probe is slightly anti flex and the first appearance of the structures we get to see is the fish mouth appearance, the typical short axis view where the mitral valve is seen like a fish mouth. And you get to see the, and, and uh, you assess the left ventricle circumferentially and the right ventricle and also the interventricular symptom and along with the, the two commissures with, and the leaflets. So this is how a transgastric short axis view at the mitral level looks like. You get to see the basal structure, the basal of the left ventricle and the anterior and the posterior leaflet. In the mid papillary view, similarly as in transthoracic, transthoracic, we saw, we just have to insert the probe a bit more inside and make it more anti flex. And the transducer angle uh, is placed around between 0 to 20 degrees, and the phase area is kept around uh, same between 0 to 20 degrees. 
where you get to see the most commonly the two both the papillary muscle and in this short axis papillary muscle view the very commonly identify is any regional wall motion abnormality that is the more commonly the in, uh, the closer to the probe that is seen on the upper side of the screen is the inferior wall the farther from the farthest from the probe is the anterior and the interventricular septum and the lateral side on the right side of the screen is seen the lateral wall so this is a live video this is how a hypertrophic heart looks like and you get to see the both the papillary muscle and also the volume status is paid so uh, this is a video of a normal volumic patient so if you get to see a video like this this is what i was talking about any young patient we should not miss a video and how a color flow imaging actually helps so if you place a color flow doppler this is a mid esophageal four chamber view in a trans esophageal echocardiography examination you get to see a mosaic pattern of flow across the mitral valve towards the left atrium and that shows a patient having underlying severe mitral regurgitation we should not be missed out uh, because it uh, changes the whole plan of perioperative and post operative management this is, a, this is another view which shows a severe regional wall motion abnormality you can see uh, this is again a trans esophageal echocardiography view where the inferior wall that is the wall which is very close to the probe that is the upper side of the screen you can see instead of moving inside it is moving more outside so that's what the inferior wall is having a kinet a hypokinesia is identified and at last uh, thank you for a patient hearing so uh, i guess i am try i am able to uh, though i am not able to demonstrate i am uh, able to at least make some point that echocardiography as a point of care ultrasound it does help anesthetists in this present era and we should be able to uh, be aware of at least some of the basic views of transthoracic and if possible also trans esophageal echocardiography whenever we are posted in cardiac anesthesia thank you very much and have for a pleasant uh, hearing thank you dibendut thank you very much that was i think a very very comprehensive and a very elaborate uh, presentation and uh, i am sure for the uninitiated some some of the things might appear to be difficult uh, it it is just that it is with practice and with time that uh, things become uh, more what would i say more easy to grasp and be easy to access and easy to understand and therefore easy to apply and but i think dipendu made a uh, fantastic effort in putting everything into it together so that it, i think it's it's it should be kind of an initiation to bigger things and i think somebody uh, was asking whether this recording will be available in yes it will be available in the hcp edu forum uh, the the online classes section all that you have to do is that uh, once uh, you get a email from hcp edu forum all you have to do is to reply back with your feedback and then you will get a link to the uh, to the online video session so that which you can get get to and listen at your leisure and or possibly recollect what was being said uh, i'll just take up a few questions i think uh, one of that was that uh, what exactly is a phased array probe and how does a phased array probe help and uh, what happens if you don't have a phased array probe ah so as i uh, said initially in the st uh, starting a phased array probe is a newly developed uh, initially the ultrasound uh, they use linear array or rather linear probes were used where the now phased array is a more complicated but it is generated in a phased manner where uh, higher wavelengths are used and this is arranged uh, from only because of the help of piezoelectric elements which are now developed in most of the all the probes which are available in the market and the uh, reason behind it is without a phased array probe you get, this is more advanced way of identifying the structures and we can do all the modalities in the same uh, with using the same probe so like by using the same probe we actually you are identifying the motion mode you are identifying the uh, amplitude mode and also you are identifying the color mode so i so if you uh, so that's how the advanced technique and that's how the phase array helps us yeah lovely and uh, there's another question to you dibindu is that uh, why would you not do it in a person who's had a bariatric surgery in the past uh, the bariatric surgery as i said 
uh, it's all at the decision making by the uh, anesthetist but as a general pediatric surgery again they are have might have operated in the uh, gastric so if you don't know the history properly what kind of surgery was done if it's something related to the gastroesophageal junction and you insert a toe probe and you are not an expert you may land up in injuring some structures because it is totally we are not, not seeing what is there inside so better to go for a trans thoracic or even if you want to a bariatric surgery after not an immediate surgery say maybe more than 6 months maybe the tissues will be more stronger to handle any sort of uh, insertions by any external uh, structures like trans thoracic so eco, e, trans eco pro so that's why I manage. It's one of the relative contraindications. So if it is done by an expertise or who are doing it regularly, they may obviously go ahead if it is required. Obviously, it gives us a better uh, chance of identifying or it's one of the better tool than trans thoracic. Absolutely. Uh, especially if somebody has undergone a sleeve gastrectomy or there is something with the GE where there has been anastomosis or there have been staples over there, there is this eutomosis or there have been staples over there. There is this huge risk that this uh, the probe itself can cause a perforation. And many people uh, currently would say that if you know that this person has had a bariatric surgery or you know that a person has possibly has varices and you think that trans uh, thoracic uh, trans esophageal echocardiography will change parameters. Uh, it's uh, many people would possibly then do uh, uh, preoperative upper GI endoscopy as a screening before you do the intraoperative T so that you know what is in store for you. Yeah, I, I guess that's what the standard for an elective procedure when you know uh, invasive TOE is required. Obviously, we need to rule out uh, as uh, Dr. Sengupta sir said. So that's how the plan is. For an emergency scenario, we have to be a bit careful. We need to uh, rule out the, uh, we need to balance between the benefit and the risk risk benefit ratio. Correct. Absolutely. Uh, I, I cannot understand if uh, if you can elaborate, Dr. Kapoor, as to what you mean by can anybody do with linear probe? Do what with a linear probe? Uh, linear probe is used for superficial structures. The most commonly what we are using is for vessels. So the linear probe is used for using vessels and blocks. So now blocks are more commonly yeah. given. So, correct. If you want to do an... Uh, IJV cannulation, all that you need is a high frequency linear probe, press it over here. Or if you want to, for anesthesiologists who are putting in blocks all around, you can do. But then uh, I don't think you will be able to see a, 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 a structure at the depth at which the heart is uh, with just a simple high frequency probe. The cardiovascular uh, analysis cannot be done by any uh, linear probe. Only the maximum, the plural thickening and all that can be. But I guess that is not the way to do it. It's better for a trans thoracic echo. Yeah. I think, Dibindu, you please stick around uh, yes, because sir. there will be questions later sure. on. Uh, meanwhile, I think, uh, since I don't see any more questions coming in, we will start with the, uh, the next session, which will be about... Uh, the preoperative management of cardiac risk for non-cardiac surgery and uh, you'll have to bear up with me for this uh, ne next session so uh, it's essentially a kind of uh, what i would say uh, continuation of what we did last week which was uh, evaluation of the cardiac risk prior to a non-cardiac surgery and this is uh, can we do something in the preoperative uh, period about uh, uh, the cardiac risk before a non-cardiac surgery. We, we do know that cardiovascular complications such as myocardial infarction, heart failure, or a death which is attributable to coronary heart disease pose some of the most significant risks to patients undergoing major non-cardiac surgery. So we, we are quite aware that cardiac morbidity, mortality, pulmonary morbidity, mortality, are possibly the two most worrisome complications or uh, adverse outcomes after uh, any non-cardiac surgery, along with possibly neurological. Uh, as I said, uh, in the previous week, we discussed about evaluation of cardiac risk prior to a non-cardiac surgery, the perioperative evaluation of uh, 
the uh, coronary artery disease, heart failure, and we also dealt with uh, valvular heart disease. Can what uh, risk evaluation in valvular heart disease do we do? Uh, if you look at cardiac risk factors that would bother before a non-cardiac surgery, it's obviously things like heart failure, uh, coronary artery disease, and the the incidence or the if there is the presence of an acute coronary syndrome. Valvular heart disease, arrhythmias, and hypertension. Uh, since we kind of discussed uh, already about what needs to be done if there is heart failure, and especially about uh, uh, especially a, a decompensated heart failure or a resistant heart failure, which is resistant to therapy, I think the 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 take home message uh, that we figured out was that if it is stable heart failure then both urgent emergency surgery can go ahead stable heart failure uh, good functional status uh, elective surgery can go ahead without further testing without further modification but it is in the decompensated heart and uh, if it, uh, it, 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 it there is a decompensated heart and you uh, uh, the patient needs an urgent or uh, um, emergency surgery, you still might have some time, maybe six, uh, 12 hours, 24 hours to try and compensate. But in the resistant heart failure group, then you have to really take a hard call as to whether uh, this person should go ahead with a non-cardiac surgery or not, because the risks, the post-operative outcomes are very, very bad. You have to take a hard call. Uh, consensus opinion to be arrived at as to whether the person will benefit from that particular non-cardiac surgery. With uh, valvular disorders, it was it again is about whether the valvular heart disease is the person is symptomatic or the person is stable despite even uh, severe. Not forget the moderate. A stenotic valve or this uh, mild stenotic valve, even with a severe stenotic valve as per the anatomical definition of it, if they're not symptomatic, you can go ahead with the elective non-cardiac surgery. But if it is symptomatic, you will have to uh, address the valve issue first before you go ahead with a, uh, with a non-cardiac surgery. Arrhythmias, the most bothersome arrhythmias would be the, the malignant bradyarrhythmias like uh, uh, the complete heart block wherein that needs to be addressed, whether with a, with a, per, a temporary or a permanent uh, solution and then taken up. And if it is the common arrhythmias like an atrial fibrillation, if this, there are no symptoms, if the ventricular rate is controlled, then possibly you again go ahead with the non-cardiac surgery. But if it is not so, then uh, the cause evaluation is done or a new onset atrial fibrillation. It, the, the cause needs to be figured out before you uh, proceed with a non-cardiac surgery. So since we discussed this the last time, we will not do it this time. What we will discuss over the next half an hour or so would be revascularization prior to uh, uh, surgery, whether they need it or not, and then what needs to be done with these cardiovascular drugs, which the patients would be, the management of these drugs like beta blockers, antiplatelets, clonidine, or any other alpha 2 agonists, statins, ACE inhibitors, and ARBs, and the nitrates. Uh, before we proceed further, can we, Jyoti, can you, can we start off the poll questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, so we'll start off the poll questions. And again, the poll questions are essentially trying to figure out what the take home message is. And uh, you uh, please feel free. It is uh, completely con uh, 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 confidential. Nobody gets to know who is answering what. So, but uh, please feel free to answer them. It's like a multiple choice. You have to just uh, click on the what do you think is the right choice or the right opinion. And uh, we will come out with the answers at the end of the uh, session. So the first uh, MCQ or the first poll is about which of the following is not an antiplatelet drug. So or which of these following do not have antiplatelet function? Is it ibuprofen or is it ticargalor, prasugrel or is it heparin? So all you have to do is 
tell us what is what do you think which of these do not have uh, antiplatelet action so if you are done this is very simple we'll proceed to the next one uh, the next poll question comes up now and this is about uh, like is about decision making okay uh, so there's a 55 year old male with known coronary artery disease so symptomatic a uh, score of three, angina three, breathlessness three, is diabetic. Uh, I, I'm, sh I'm sorry, this should have been a, a female. It is a 55-year-old female. I'm sorry about the typing error over there. Has CA breast. The plan is uh, breast surgery, uh, surgical oncology. Uh, she has mets of three. A Darcy score, we, we discussed hugely on this last uh, Friday. Uh, they decided that since they need surgery and there is poor functional status, they did a stress test, which came out positive. Uh, the surgical oncologist feels that they can wait for six weeks plus. And the cardiology opinion is this person needs a revascularization and they are doing the percutaneous uh, intervention. And uh, so what, what will be the plans to you after revascularization with dual antiplatelet therapy after six weeks? Will you continue aspirin and clopidogrel and proceed for surgery six weeks down the line? Would you continue stop clopidogrel for five days, continue aspirin, proceed for surgery? Would you stop clopidogrel, continue aspirin, start low molecular weight heparin and proceed for surgery? Or would you say clopidogrel, stop aspirin, start tarofiban, and then proceed for surgery? So take your time. And uh, let us know what you feel about this. Post drug eluting stent with dual antiplatelet therapy, needing a CA breast surgery, what do you think you do when, they come, when the lady comes six weeks down the line? Continue aspirin and, and clopidogrel and proceed for surgery, or just stop clopidogrel, continue aspirin and then go for surgery, or stop clopidogrel, continue with the aspirin, start the low molecular weight heparin and go for surgery, or is it... Uh, Stop clopidogrel, stop aspirin, aspirin, and start tarofiban, and go ahead for surgery. I think we'll close the poll in five, four, three, two, one, zero. We'll go to the next poll question. Okay. So the next poll question. is uh, a 65 year old male similar kind of a thing known coronary artery disease, uh, artery disease ccs3 and yj3 and but this person has a brain tumor and needs a neurosurgery again uh, the uh, opinion of the third neurosurgeon is that that person can wait for six weeks cardiology opines for uh, percutaneous in, uh, intervention so they think about uh, they have decided to put in a drug eluting stent with dual antiplatelet therapy, six weeks down the line, now what will you do? Stop aspirin and clopidogrel for five days and proceed for surgery? Or stop only clopidogrel, continue with aspirin and proceed for surgery? Stop clopidogrel, continue aspirin, again, start low molecular weight heparin and continue for surgery? Or stop clopidogrel for five days, stop aspirin for three days, Start tyrofiban and continue for surgery. Similar kind of a scenario like the previous one. This one is neurosurgery. Again, drug eluting stent, dual antiplatelet therapy. But six weeks down the line, now the neurosurgeon wants to go in. So what will you do? Stop both the dual antiplatelet therapy and proceed. Stop clopidogrel for five days, continue aspirin, proceed for surgery. 
stop clopidogrel, continue aspirin, start low molecular weight heparin, or stop clopidogrel for five days, stop aspirin for three days, start tyrofiban, and then proceed for surgery. I think I've given mm -hmm. enough time for you to think. This is uh, so. Please put in your uh, uh, instead of putting it on the chat box. Uh, what, uh, please put in into the poll. You can uh, uh, answer there, and uh, once you are done, we'll proceed to the next one. So the fourth poll question. It's again about decision making. So this is a 57-year-old male with known coronary artery disease who is hypertensive and diabetic, has CA thyroid. The plan is thyroidectomy. The functional status is good. Med scores are 6. The DASI score, the Duke Activity Status Index score is 42. Uh, blood parameters are good. ECG shows an anterolateral ischemia. And uh, the left ventricular ejection fraction is 45%. There is diastolic dysfunction. So how, now that you are trying to reach a consensus opinion. So you discuss with the cardiologist, cardiac surgeon, the, uh, the thyroid surgeon, then and you decide that uh, no, we need to do an angiogram, which should be followed by a CABG and then thyroidectomy after six months. This other option is you discuss with the cardiologist, cardiac surgeon, the thyroid surgeon, you think of doing an angiogram followed by angioplasty, put in a drug eluting stent, dual antiplatelet therapy, then do a thyroidectomy after six months. Or you take a consensus opinion of the cardiologist, the thyroid surgeon, the patient and relatives, you maximize medical therapy and would you then proceed with thyroidectomy? So what would you do in this scenario? Would you decide to do an angiogram, a CABG, and then wait for six months and then do the thyroid surgery? Angiogram followed by a drug eluting stent, dual antiplatelet therapy, wait for six months, and then take up for surgery? or maximize medical therapy and proceed with thyroidectomy. So this person has good functional status, a reasonable DASI score. What would you do? I think if you have completed your voting, we will go to the next and the last of the poll questions in five, four, three, two, one, zero. Can we go to the next poll question? Again, this is again about decision making. And uh, this is a 55 year old known coronary artery disease who has a history of myocardial infarction two years back with a history of heart failure nine months back. Uh, diabetic, CCS is two, MET scores are around four, uh, the Duke Activity Status Index is around 34, just about okay. The heart rate is 82 per minute. Uh, serum uh, biochemistry and hematology parameters are okay. Now, this gentleman has chronic calculus cholecystitis and uh, would need a gallbladder surgery. Now, uh, this obviously the, you have decided that needs a beta blocker therapy. So, what should be the ideal beta blocker therapy in this? person. Would you start atenolol four weeks prior to surgery and go for a target heart rate of 60 to 70? Metoprolol four days four days prior to surgery, target heart rate 60 to 70. Bisoprolol four hours prior to surgery with a target of 60 to 70. Or IV esmolol four minutes prior to surgery with a target of 60 to 70 heart rate. So you need uh, heart rate control in this gentleman, coronary artery disease, MI. So he's got all the indications for which you need uh, a beta blocker therapy. Unfortunately, he has not been on beta blocker therapy when you're seeing him. You see the heart rate is 82. So what will you do? Atenolol four weeks before and then wait, take up for surgery. This person can wait. Uh, metoprolol four days prior to surgery, get a target to 60 to 70, which is the most ideal. 
Bisoprolol four hours prior to surgery, target 60 to 70. If it get the target, go in. IV esmolol four minutes prior to surgery and then take it up. So again, let's see what the valued attendees think of about it. And we will go end the poll questions in five, four, three, two, one zero and we go to our deliberations so thank you uh, i would just uh, begin with just trying to figure out why and what you need to manage about cardiac risks coming in for non-cardiac surgery and uh, this is uh, about uh, let's begin with the pathophysiology uh, this is uh, like a cartoon which i made quite some time back and this is one of my favorite cartoons is that you see sur surgery uh, incites an inflammatory response and also a neuroendocrine stress response. Now, these are two things that a surgical insult will always do. Okay. And because of the inflammatory response, it leads to an hypercoagulable state during the surgical process. And in a person who has a coronary artery disease, who has plaque, this can lead to a plaque rupture. This leads to a th formation of a thrombus, a, uh, an embolus, which can proceed further. And this leads to a scenario in, in that area where you can have a decreased oxygen delivery. Uh, the neuroendocrine stress response is responsible for the catecholamine surge. And that catecholamine surge changes the hemodynamic response. You have an increased heart rate, blood pressure. And it also incites a metabolic change, uh, the, the, whether it is the growth hormone related, insulin related, uh, uh, glucocorticoid related. And this creates an environment of an increased oxygen demand and which creates this environment towards a perioperative myocardial injury infarction. So unless you handle this in a, in a setting that there is a compromised with the coronary artery, the vasculature, you have run the higher risk of having a perioperative uh, MI, which is what is the bothersome thing. So what else during surgery can make it worse? Yes, you have during surgery uh, fall in blood pressure. You have in surgery bleeding, which causes decrease in PCV or the hematocrit, which decreases again the ability of the hemoglobin to carry oxygen. Uh, any stage wherein the compromise with the gas exchange leading to an hypoxic event or a vasoconstriction around that area, which can decrease oxygen delivery. And uh, metabolic changes like shivering in the post-operative period can increase the oxygen oxygen demand all these are creating an atmosphere wherein your the myocardium can be jeopardized and it can lead to mitral injury leading to the fatal mi that we are really really bothered about so all our efforts are in trying to see that these things do not happen okay so the situations that we deal with in the pre-operative period is you might have a patient who has just had uh, acute coronary syndrome recently and now needs a non-cardiac surgery which can be emergency surgery urgent surgery which can be an elective surgery so how will you base your decisions on that a patient who has a known history of coronary artery disease and now needs an emergency or an urgent non-cardiac surgery so how will you deal with that then you might have a scenario where there is a patient who has coronary artery disease is unstable, like the ones that we were talking about, a scenario like CCS3, NYHA3, uh, and uh, you possibly do stress tests and you figure out that there is instability uh, and might be needs some kind of coronary vascularization, maybe a CBG, maybe a percutaneous in intervention, and then at some point of time will need that non-cardiac surgery. And if you're lucky, then you might have somebody with a coronary artery disease stable and needs a non-cardiac surgery. I think these are the things that you are possibly going to deal with. So let us deal with the first scenario, a patient with a recent acute coronary syndrome. 
So the management of the acute coronary syndrome is urgent revascularization. I think now the evidence is very strongly in is towards urgent revascularization, which and urgent revascularization will initiate the dual antiplatelet therapy. And because you initiate the dual antiplatelet therapy, it will lead to a delay in the timing of the proposed non-cardiac surgery. So you will have to accept that. And uh, then after you have done this, whatever intervention you have done, and the person is on dual antiplatelet therapy, when should you do the non-cardiac surgery? And this is these two things that bothers you. On one side is dual antiplatelet therapy, I will stop the dual antiplatelet therapy prematurely because I think you needs to go in for surgery and the surgery needs to happen. And because of this uh, uh, premature discontinuation of the dual antiplatelet therapy, am I sending this person more towards having a cardiac event? And to the other hand is, no, I cannot stop the dual antiplatelet therapy. Dual antiplatelet therapy needs to go on and therefore i delay surgery and therefore i am bothered about the poor quality of life and more so in onco surgery the concern about the progression of cancer from an operable stage you get into a inoperable stage so that is the 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 big huge dilemma to which you need to get bothered about what happens about patients who need urgent or emergent surgery. I think because the uh, the procedure takes so much of the uh, uh, the greater importance, I think everything else becomes secondary and the person needs to go in. So whether the person has a coronary artery disease and or a heart failure, stable heart failure, not bothered, even if it is decompensated, maybe the pathophysiology for which the person is needing the urgent or the emergency surgery can tip the person towards decompensation, you possibly try it for six to eight hours and then you have to go in. Even with a severe valvular heart disease, maybe symptomatic aortic stenosis, uh, if it is a bleeding abdomen, uh, you will have to go in, isn't it? You don't have much of a choice. You possibly can get a cardiologist on board if you know and so that he can help you in the decision making as to what goal directed hemodynamic monitoring and medication management which needs to be done in the preoperative period and which needs to be uh, extended into the post-operative period. That's what you would possibly think about doing. Uh, even the same thing, if with acute coronary syndrome, with a decompensated heart failure, the benefit and the risks, as I think that we were talking about this, about the heart failure, uh, you will have to take a real big call as to whether we need to go ahead with this surgery. Uh, unless it is life-saving, limb-saving, which most of your emergency surgery would be, I think you have no other choice but to go ahead. So it, it, it has to be individualized and it has to be a collective opinion. Don't take the X completely on your shoulder and uh, take a call on that. So coming to revascularization before surgery, let us ask a few questions. Who would need revascularization? If I'm leaving out those two uh, uh, the, uh, the subsets, about acute need this is about chronic when do you do and i think this is the perplexing question when do you do the revascularization and then when do you time the non-cardiac surgery and what is the preferred revascularization is it a percutaneous intervention like an angioplasty stent or is it a coronary artery bypass grafting and the question that uh, uh, especially percutaneous intervention brings in is the dual antiplatelet therapy which you need to have the patients on. So I think the first thing which was answered, who needs revascularization prior to non-cardiac surgery? Anybody with an acute coronary syndrome will need it. But there are other things where patients might need. Suppose there is an elective non-cardiac surgery which can wait You've done a risk assessment based upon both the surgical, the surgery, as well as the clinical risk. And you figured out that the MACE is possibly greater than 1%, maybe greater than even 5%. You find that the MET scores are low. The Duke activity scores are low. So functional status is poor. And there is a collective decision which says that, we yes, we will do further pre-operative testing. 
which is includes an abnormal uh, stress testing which comes out to be abnormal and then the collective decision is that you have to this person would benefit by revascularization and this benefit is not just a short term perioperative benefit the benefit is a long term benefit even after the non cardiac surgery so these are the group of patients where maybe you will do um, revascularization uh, there are certain uh, i think which dibendu also talked about is certain features on non invasive testing like stress dobutamine stress testing which can give you a clue that this person would was benefit by revascularization prior to an elective non cardiac surgery that can wait what are these if you see a reversible large anterior wall defect so it's not uh, dyskinetic but it is hypokinetic by a large anterior wall defect there are multiple reversible defects uh, an ischemia that is occurring at a low heart rate so you don't have the heart rate is not going up but there is ischemic changes happening uh, there are extensive stress induced wall motion abnormalities and even there is a transient ischemic dilatation it's not long term but it is transient so these are some of the indications uh, indices wherein you think revascularization will be needed should prophylactic revascularization be done before non -car uh, cardiac surgery and then we are talking about somebody who has known coronary artery disease but is stable say for example has a ccs of 2 nyha of 2 good functional status uh, met score of 5 6 7 8 uh, dasi scores uh, above, above 34 so the consensus opinion today based on evidence is there is no benefit in improving the perioperative outcomes by doing a prophylactic revascularization and uh, uh, this is which is known to us for the last 15 20 years and one of the i think the path breaking publication which led people to believe this was the car trial published in 2004 coronary artery revascularization before major vascular surgeries and this is possibly the the highest degree or grade of difficulty other than possibly thoracic surgeries as a non cardiac surgery wherein the incidence of perioperative uh, adverse cardiac events are the highest so the macfall study the carb study they found out that they had basically two arms. One was one patients who underwent revascularization, and that is either with CABG or with a percutaneous intervention and intervention. And the other who went just medical therapy, uh, goal directed outcomes, and then they underwent the vascular surgery. If you look at the immediate outcomes prior to vascular surgery, there were 10 deaths in the revascularization group versus just one death in the uh, no revascularization group. So right at the beginning, these, uh, the revascularization group did not do well. And if you look at the 30 days events, which is in the post-operative period. So this patient survived, underwent the vascular surgery. And if you look at uh, two sides, this is the one side that showed uh, patients who underwent revascularization. And this is the uh, table for patients who did not undergo revascularization. You see, there is no significant change in the all uh, cause outcomes for death, MI, MI based on enzymes, as well as ECG, strokes uh, renal dysfunction reoperation uh, days in the icu days in the hospital so revascularization versus no revascularization there was hardly any change and uh, if you look at the kaplar meier curve and then you know, when you're looking at uh, things which are going up to four years five years six years you fact that you'll find that uh, no revascularizations the people at risk were actually lower so which essentially got us to, or got the world to believe that coronary artery revascularization before elective major vascular surgery which is now equal to major non cardiac surgery there is possibly no uh, uh, kind of a, 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 a 
opinion or no guidance towards doing it so it is not recommended that you do a coronary artery revascularization either with cbg or percutaneous intervention prophylactically in a stable patient before a major non cardiac surgery so now comes the question what do you do with an unstable coronary artery disease where a non cardiac surgery can you can wait then you have just obviously two options you can do a cbg or a percutaneous intervention now is cbg the preferred option now if you go by the credo kyoto pci cbg registry this is one of this uh, very few to find a cardiology trial which has been not find, funded by any pharmacological uh, or the industry and uh, from that you find that the risk of primary ischemic outcome was not significantly different between the cbg group versus the pci group but in the cbg group uh, versus the pci group it was associated with a lower bleeding risk you find a hazard risk of a ratio of only 0.36 in the cbg group so maybe based on this some people were of the idea that a cbg could be a preferred option uh, essentially this bleeding risk is lower because post cbg you can be just on aspirin you don't need a dual antiplatelet therapy and uh, it can uh, it can the this can the patient can go in for non cardiac surgery the problem with cbg is just the risk involved in undergoing that procedure that is intraoperative uh, issues then the issue about recuperation rehabilitation which is time consuming the issues with wound healing the huge issue with sternal dehiscence and if especially if you are uh, then thinking of uh, doing a non cardiac surgery on the neck on the thorax or in the upper abdomen this becomes a big big issue and also how much is the uh, uh, the the uh, the uh, how well behaved are the lungs post surgery and how quickly can they undergo another major uh, surgical insult is a huge issue with cabg the problem with pci percutaneous intervention is the problem with the dual antiplatelet therapy we know that 10% of cardiac deaths after stent placement are attributable to stent thrombosis and uh, it is essentially because of the delayed endothelialization which is that the neointimal coverage is not happening and that leads to early instant thrombus formation now how long can we wait for this after a percutaneous intervention and you do a non elective surgery and the question can be addressed in another way you know that this person is waiting for a non cardiac surgery the person needs percutaneous intervention or revascularization so if i can wait for a given days what should be my revascularization percutaneous revascularization of choice so the traditional advice has been that if you can wait for uh, around 30 days and not beyond 30 days then just uh, balloon angioplasty or poba is the preferred option if you can wait beyond 30 days but cannot wait beyond 6 months then the best option is bare metal stents but if you can wait beyond 180 days and this is in the last 5 7 years previously it used to be 365 days one year uh, then you can go ahead with tragiluting stent this has undergone a change over the last 5 years or so and especially this is because of the second generation drug eluting stents that have come in and again the traditional advice i say this is volume 2 is that if you can wait for 14 days and not beyond 14 days then go ahead and just do a balloon angioplasty if you can wait up to 2 months 60 days then maybe bare metal stents and if you can wait beyond 60 days then think of drug eluting stents Uh, but this also is being severely questioned now prior to this i think this is i think i have i'll keep coming back and saying this again and again when you are thinking of doing a revascularization prior to a non cardiac surgery think whether both the percutaneous intervention is absolutely needed the person deserves it how much uh, the, does the patient deserve the non cardiac surgery in the non cardiac surgery what is the risk of bleeding and the consequences of non uh, risk of bleeding due in this surgery and this all this whether they need revascularization whether they need uh, 
the non-cardiac surgery when which one needs to be done has to be a consensus between the surgeon cardiologist anesthesiologist the patient and the relatives if it was an ideal scenario the non-cardiac surgery can wait then please go ahead and do a percutaneous intervention delay the elective surgery for six months let them be on dual antiplatelet for six months and then take them patient up for non-cardiac surgery the risk of adverse cardiac events are much less in that scenario unfortunately you will not be uh, able to do it in most of your clinical settings you find that yes i can wait but i cannot wait maybe beyond four weeks maybe beyond six weeks if these are intermediate equity surgeries De definitely i can't wait beyond three months the person needs to be uh, taken up and but you need to revascularize you need to be these patients need to be on dual antiplatelets uh, they should they will be on a short difference in the dual antiplatelet and if you look at data that came up 10 years or 15 years back even then you figured out 2012 may not 15 years maybe is eight or 10 years back then they figured out that the risk of adverse cardiac event early the difference between bare metal stent and drug eluting stent was hardly anything especially in when you're discontinuing the dual antiplatelet therapy it was then that the quality of evidence was low come the second generation drug eluting stents versus the bare metal stents today you don't have any evidence to suggest that the use of bare metal stents compared with drug eluting stents allows for a shorter period of uh, dual antiplatelet therapy and there is a strong evidence from the ZUS trial, from the leaders free, from the senior trial, all cardiology trials, suggesting that cardiovascular outcomes are better with drug eluting stents when dual antiplatelet therapy is used for a shorter period. So if you need to actually stop it, don't put in a bare metal, it's still better for a drug eluting. If, if you come to our institution and talk with our cardiologist, all of them will give you the same opinion. Now you have a person who has got undergone a revascularization is on dual antiplatelet and on a non-cardiac surgery. The ideal, in an ideal situation, continue it for six months, discontinue the, uh, uh, the uh, platelet receptor blocker for a short duration as possible and continue the aspirin. This is what the cardiologist will be the most happiest. The surgeons are sometimes happy, sometimes not happy. Assess the risk of bleeding, especially if it is something like a, uh, a neurosurgery, a, a, a intradurals, even a spine surgery, posterior chamber of the eye surgery, prost uh, prostate surgery. The risk of bleeding is extremely high. You have to stop. You it is advisable to stop both. If you have stopped the clopidogrel or any of these uh, platelet receptor blockers, start it as a. Uh, what are the guidelines for stopping this P2Y12 inhibitors prior to non-cardiac surgery? Clopidogrel is for five days, Prasugrel is for seven days, Takagirar is for three to five days. If you have stopped it, restart it with a loading dose in consultation with the surgeon. And uh, some people say 300 milligram, some people would say 600 milligram as early as possible. And uh, patients with these stains where the dual antiplatelet therapy has been stopped for a brief period of time, for a brief period of time and early on it is wiser to do any of this non cardiac surgery where you have a backup for 24 hour interventional cardiology cover because if something happens then your only option is to go in and open up the uh, stents again uh, is there a role of platelet transfusion Patients who are at increased risk of bleeding and where you had uh, hardly any time to discontinue, it can be used as for excessive bleeding after surgery. There is no role as yet from any evidence of a prophylactic platelet transfusion before non-cardiac surgery in that scenario. How much does bridging or an alternative therapy to dual antiplatelet therapy works? People have tried the GP2B3A inhibitors such, such as tyrofiban and FTFibidid. And uh, some academic centers have uh, used this strategy in high risk patients of, uh, for high risk of stent thrombosis. But the bleeding associated with it is much higher and possibly in, uh, in, in experienced hands in most surgeons will possibly not be very happy doing it. So not very recommended. 
Should we start heparin, low molecular weight heparin as an alternative to dual antiplatelet therapy? I think the British Medical Bulletin in 2017, this was a lovely, lovely review. Please go through it. Uh, it, it completely gives you an opinion on this. The parental anticoagulants such as heparin do not decrease the risk of stent thrombosis and therefore should not be used as a substitute to antiplatelet therapy, commonly used, but uh, without much evidence behind it. So how medical management helps in decreasing the risk? We'll give, go back to the same cartoon. If you look at it, uh, the inflammatory response is taken care of by the statins, the antiplatelets, and the nitrates, whereas the neuroendocrine response is taken care of by the alpha-2 agonists, the uh, uh, analgesics, the inflammatory, uh, the metabolic response, you can try it with insulin, and the neuroendocrine, the catecholamine surge, taken care of by the beta blockers. Add to this, if you have hypotension, you use vasopressors, you have bleeding, you increase the oxygen capacity by transfusing PRBCs, giving extra oxygen, and uh, obviously warm, keeping the patient warm. So trying to see that the milieu is not changed so much and you manage it that well. So what about the management of the cardiovascular drugs? I'll just, what I will do is each of these drugs, I will just go by what is the ACC AHA 2014 recommendations. So please go through that text. I'm just, this is a revision of that text. Nothing that is my opinion. It is just what is what the ACC AHA tells you. Uh, this is a uh, straightforward patients chronically on beta blockers continue beta blockers, uh, category of recommendation is one. Uh, on beta blockers, uh, should we give them beta club course in the post-operative period? It is obviously according to clinical circumstances. If you find a person hypotensive in the beta blocker, uh, in the post-operative period, a bradycardic, you don't, obviously don't give it. Intermediate or high risk of myocardial ischemia, which is noted in the preoperative uh, testing, it is, and not on beta blockers, it is reasonable to begin perioperative beta blockers. So the first thing they say is, is reasonable to begin, and now the question will come when to begin. In patients of three or more uh, Lee's cardiac risk index factors, but among uh, whether if they have three of these six, it may be reasonable to again begin beta blockers before non-cardiac surgery those who are not on that. Uh, again, the same thing for those who should be on a beta blocker, you start a beta blocker and now they are coming. When do you start? It is preferably that you do it two to four weeks prior to surgery. So your best benefit is possibly two to four weeks prior to surgery. Uh, a compelling long-term indication but there is no, uh, the RCRI is score is one or less uh, one, then just initiating a beta blocker in the perioperative on the preoperative for to reducing just the risk of the surgery is there is, the people have said that it is of uncertain benefit. Again, we first heard from them is that it is preferably two to four weeks if you have missed the bus two to four weeks and you think that they should have been on uh, beta blockers has not been on beta blockers and should be on long-term beta blockers at least start it one day prior to surgery and till or if you till you take the time to reach that target heart rate of 70 to 80. and i think this is uh, category three recommendation that beta blockers should not be, I think that it should not be started on the day of surgery. I think the POIS study clearly brought that out. So what is the choice of agent? There is no strong evidence which suggests that one agent is better than another. So don't try to switch beta blockers. Uh, the agents that have shown benefit are the ones they are usually one are the selective card, uh, beta one cardio selective ones, whether it is atenolol, metoprolol or bisoprolol, even between the three of them, there has been no evidence to suggest which is one is superior to the other. So do not try to change or uh, manipulate these agents in the preoperative period. 
target is a heart rate of 60 to 70. Blood pressure, should I give a beta blocker on the morning of surgery? You give this uh, beta blocker if the systolic blood pressures are 100 and greater than 130. Uh, if it is between 115 to 130, then give half the dose. This is what again, the 2014. And if it is less than 115, uh, withhold the beta blockers. So essentially what we try to do is uh, instead of doing the 150, we find the 120 mark easier to operate with. What about the ACE inhibitors and the angiotensin uh, receptor blockers? I think this, the evidence has been like a yo-yo. We first heard that uh, anybody with ACE inhibitors, ARBs, do not give it because they will cause severe perioperative hypotension. Then came uh, a few years later, ACCH is saying that uh, no. If they were on long-term ACE inhibitors, ARBs given for heart failure, remodeling of the left ventricle, they should be given the ACE or the ARB prior to surgery. 2014, I hope they come out with something more definitive. It says that if continuation of the ACE or ARBs is reasonable, they're not saying that it can be done, should not be done, it is up to you. But if you have withdrawn it prior to surgery, please restart it as quickly as you can in the post-operative period. So it has left it to you. What we usually would do if it is a major surgery where you think that the fluid shifts is going to be much more. And if you think that there is a high risk of hypotension that is going to be happening, we possibly withhold the ACE and the ARP on the morning of surgery. Alpha-2 agonists, there is no role of clonidine to be used to do hemodynamic uh, manipulations in the perioperative period at all, category 3. Statins. Patients with coronary artery disease or a coronary equivalent like DMCAD, uh, carotid artery disease, peripheral artery disease, with a, with, they should receive statin therapy. That's what uh, some people would disagree. I think this is some evidence which has come up in the last year or so, which possibly now uh, puts this very emphatic statements into question. But till then, I think we go in with this. So continue statin therapy. And there is also a to be recommendation saying that you can start statins therapy in this group of individuals. Uh, about What about nitrates? Uh, the recommendation is that it is not recommended prophylactically. If they have been on nitrates, they continue. And this is after the 2016 Cochrane review. There was not a uh, significant difference in the primary study, all cause mortality for 30, at 30 days about any preparation of nitrate. And because there is this issue that it can cause, decrease the preload, which can outweigh its benefit, which is why uh, based upon that nitrate, that you use prophylactically is not recommended. Antiplatelet therapy, I think we went through this extensively. I will not go through this again. If uh, uh, after bare metal stents, it's, I think a lot of this will change over the years. So it's whether it's six weeks or six months. And uh, again, if you, if you have to stop, you can stop the clopidogrel, do not stop the aspirin, continue the aspirin into the uh, intraoperative phase, restart the clopidogrel as quickly as you can. And um, this decision is uh, taken not only by the anesthesiologist, but it's a consensus opinion of the cardiologist, the surgeon, and he has to come in about the risk of bleeding and its consequences, things like neurosurgery, you need to stop both. Uh, there is no point in giving aspirin to just a person who has got a coronary artery disease, no and uh, no uh, uh, stents in uh, place, no previous history of CABG, just starting an aspirin does not uh, reduce the uh, risk of a perioperative adverse cardiac event. So that is about the things and let us now Close it by looking at the answers to the poll questions, which essentially is uh, are the take home messages from this deliberation. So which of the following is not or does not have antiplatelet uh, action? I found it was there was a split in opinion between um, uh, ibuprofen and heparin and uh, can we have the poll results now? No, I think we can't. Anyway, so 
the answer to this is heparin does not have antiplatelet action so which is why you cannot use heparin to uh, replace the dual antiplatelet uh, dual antiplatelet therapy and antiplatelet action uh, this is i think uh, interesting uh, ca breast undergoes uh, stenting on dual antiplatelet therapy comes after 6 weeks what will you do i think uh, there, there 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 has been a kind of difference of opinion in this that i saw uh, i would be tempted and our policy would be uh, i think uh, this is again it has to be decided upon between you and your surgeon we would be happy just by continuing aspirin and clopidogrel and proceed for surgery uh, think because it's going to be a surface surgery um, uh, and uh, if, if you can use diathermy properly, there is hardly any uh, blood loss or bleeding uh, despite the huge raw surface that you create. But since it's a surface surgery, pressure can be of great help. But the more conservative op op option would be that you stop clopidogrel, continue with it, and have aspirin on board. Remember, it has happened within six weeks or eight weeks and you proceed for surgery. Uh, as we realized over the deliberation, hardly any role in having something like low molecular heparin or even the GP2B3 receptor blockers. What happens in the same scenario if it is now a scenario of neurosurgery? I think uh, I think most of you would have uh, would, uh, kind of, I saw, uh, take the this option and which is uh, you stop both the dual antiplatelet therapy and then proceed for surgery. Because uh, it, it, these are the areas wherein a small a 5 ml uh, hematoma can have disastrous neurological consequences. So see if you the, the, the type of surgery can change the type of management. So thyroidectomy in a stable coronary artery disease, good functional status. What will you do? Will you do revascularization? I think prof and the stable coronary artery disease does prophylactic revascularization help. I think we discussed this, that uh, there is no role of doing a prophylactic revascularization, maximize the medical therapy, and then proceed with thyroidectomy. And once this uh, surgery is done, then think of possibly addressing the coronary artery disease problem. So that was about uh, stable coronary artery disease. And finally, about beta blockers, this person has, you can see, he has a RCRI score of possibly three, and is if he's going in for an, um, a major surgery, and uh, you need a heart rate control. So what is going to be the ideal thing? In an ideal scenario, if you can wait, I think, I think most of you again got there was a between between the first and the second so the drug doesn't matter the target matters so atenolol four weeks prior to surgery would be possibly the uh, way to go ahead so that is about it thank you very much and uh, do we have Questions. So I think this is uh, from Dr. Rakesh Kapoor. When do you advise for an echocardiography in an ASA1 geriatric patient? I think the first thing is uh, uh, in the current ASA, you would possibly somebody who's Class, uh, qualifies as a geriatric person would automatically become ASA2. And uh, the thing is, uh, whether you want to do an LV evaluation, it, it all it will again depend upon if this uh, uh, if this geriatric person comes in for an ingrowing toenail removal, I don't think I will do an LV evaluation. But if the person is coming in for uh, a gallbladder removal surgery, I would do an LV evaluation if the person gives me a history of coronary artery disease, if the person, uh, 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 I am not able to figure out how the functional status of this person is, uh, I will look for an LV evaluation. So it will depend upon uh, what situation, what is the clinical profile of, you can have an 80 year old who has a physiological age of 60, and you can have a 60 year old who is a, who is a cripple. So age itself, uh, 
cannot. Anybody, uh, anybody wants, anybody uh, wants to make a comment, you can uh, just uh, uh, take your cursor down to request to speak on the top that you have. And uh, I think Jati will uh, let you put your opinion over there. Uh, Dr. Rupan Bhaduri wants to know the, the GP2B3 receptors before non cardiac surgery after a PCI. I think if you go by the recommendations, uh, there is uh, currently there is no strong evidence saying that bridging with the GP2B3 receptors uh, are of any benefit. In, in fact, it, uh, the, the flip side to it is increases the risk of bleeding. So uh, I think five, six years back, there was this uh, there was this thing about bridging with GP2B3A. Currently, if you look by data, I think there is no not much of a value by uh, of adding a GP2B3A receptors. Uh, thank you, John Tudok, for being here. Uh, can a preoperative beta blocker precipitate heart failure who already has a heart, history of heart failure? I think this is a very good question. I think uh, the carvedilol trials have you know, unequivocally shown that uh, uh, patients with uh, heart with, uh, LV, uh, that uh, beta blockers have actually worked out towards their benefit. So only thing you have to uh, be careful about is uh, which beta blocker you're using in a person who has, who is, in decompensated heart failure, if it is compensated heart failure, it doesn't matter that much. So uh, uh, the uh, when we were students, I think it was a big no that a patient with a heart failure or a history of heart failure do not give beta blocker. I think that is no more the query. So it, it, it well, in fact, a higher heart rate, the person might have a greater propensity to get into a heart failure. Good evening, Anjula. Thank you for being here. In case of emergency surgery, what should be the choice of beta blocker therapy? I think if it is emergency surgery and uh, the person uh, the person is has been on beta blockers, then, uh, I think you you won't have the time to give an oral beta blocker. Uh, but if you actually need to give anything intravenous to uh, manipulate the hemodynamics, uh, the our policy would be we would start off with something very uh, with this short acting so that even if it uh, does anything, it will for a longest shorter period of time. So maybe try it with uh, 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 esmolol, and then if you think that it will be you should then look for a metoprolol. Uh, again, uh, I think a lot of interest about bridging therapy. I think I, I would ask uh, Dibendu also to uh, put in his opinion over here about whether Cangrelor can be beneficial. Again, I think the data is not towards using bridging anything. So I think, uh, yes, at present, uh, bridging therapy is it's not very much recommended let, let yes. into the phase and then look at it depending on what would you have to say on this yeah i i do agree with you sir the same thing i think even the cardiologist in our institution also do suggest the same thing like uh, for non cardiac surgery obviously the bridging therapy patients are underlying having already in stent it's not much recommended because of the chances and with high risk surgery and a minor bleeding can lead on to major effects it's one of the contraindications so only yeah. single therapy, du dual therapy is no more recommended until unless the patient has underlying complications like uh, the patient has a long stent and a complicated coronary artery disease and post PCI. So they do get when it, the cardiologists do suggest that. But otherwise, single therapy would be best enough and to avoid preoperative and then start immediate post op as discussed. Correct. Uh... 
Anjan has a question about uh, standard recommendation for stopidocline. Yeah, okay. I think that's a very good point, Anjan, that you make. Is uh, the ASRA classically says is seven days for, and this is when you're thinking of putting in a putting in blocks, and this is when you're thinking of uh, instrumenting possibly the central neuroaxis uh, and putting in catheters. That uh, the ASRA recommendation would be seven. This is the ACC AHA. This is about uh, what is more about surgical bleeding than the risk of uh, uh, a central neuroaxis hematoma. But I think this is my personal opinion. I think we will have a revisit on this, especially with uh, the advent of ultrasound in regional anesthesia, wherein uh, uh, I think you might look at changes to these guidelines happening. Yeah, I guess, sir. Uh, yeah, whether you can go ahead and do uh, blocks in patients with, but don't quote me on this. But uh, this is my personal belief. Uh, sir, if you want, uh, don't mind. I can just add on to this. Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, uh, actually, what we are doing it, and obviously under guidance of Dr. Singhupta, sir, we've been doing it uh, regularly in minimal invasive cardiac surgery. And our uh, perioperative cardiac surgery, the surgeons actually really don't want to stop the antiplatelets. They really do take up. This is not a quotation uh, quoted by any guidelines, but what the present uh, practice by most of the surgeons around is, they do prefer only to stop maximum of 72 hours of patients having coronary artery disease coming for CABGs and coming to uh, neuraxial blockade. Uh, we don't do central, and obviously the times are changing because to prevent all the complications of central neuraxial blockade, all the peripheral neuraxial blockades are coming into uh, now more into practice. And we do like serratus anterior block uh, blockage with along with catheters. And we have done uh, lots of patients. We have already uh, done thesis on this. And while practicing, we have never seen any of the patients developing hematoma or uh, bleeding complications because the antiplatelets were continued very near to the surgery. So I guess the ch changes of even the neural uh, blockade therapy is more into peripheral rather than central. So obviously the complication rates are very minimal. And, and if you, you can understand that cardiac surgeons, they are operating more into vascular structures with antiplatelets and even on heparin. So I guess that uh, thing is more a dilemma rather than a practice guidelines. Correct. I completely agree with you, Dibendu. Because we have seen our experience with uh, serratus anterior. We have seen our experience with erector spiny plane block. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, under under vision, you know, you can see where the intercostal artery is, and you'll see where you are going, which is what is the needle direction. So. Thank you, everybody, for being here. And uh, uh, I would now request uh, Dr. Jayati to wind up and uh, just guide them as to what they need to do after they uh, end this session. I would like to thank Dr. Sengupta and Dr. Khan for um, uh, this uh, wonderful, informative session. I would like to thank everyone who has joined us tonight. So the next thing is a little bit of formality, which is remaining. That is, you need to kindly send us a uh, feedback on, on how you like this session and what all are the areas in which you need improvement. And uh, you want us what all are the future sessions which you want. So that is one thing. And another part will be like um, once uh, you leave a mail in, in your inbox box, kindly send a reply to it and um, uh, just fill up the four or five pointers in the feedback form and you will get an e-certificate in which uh, you will get an acknowledgement of participation. Within 24 hours, the, the two splitted videos of Dr. Khan and Dr. Sengupta will be available in edu.hcpforum.com. Please log in and register to edu.hcpforum.com and you will be able to revisit all the lectures of this online anesthesiology session and all other sessions which we have in HCP Forum. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Sengupta. Thank you, Dr. Khan. Uh, we close tonight. And Dr. Jayati, can you just uh, remind them of this 23rd August, which I think you have put it up in the chat box, but if you can just mention it once.
Yes, uh, on 23rd of August 2020, we are having a wonderful session, Panash, during pandemic with Dr. Sen Gupta, Dr. Prithish Bhattacharya from Shillong Negrims Hospital, Dr. Ritesh and Dr. Manoj. This will be a wonderful session highlighting uh, various aspects of anesthesiology. We will share the detailed poster and the login details in a few days. So be with us, look into the HCP Forum Facebook page to know more details of this online program on 23rd of August 2020 from 6 p.m. onwards with Dr. Sen Gupta, Dr. Bhattacharya and others. So thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Khan. Thank you, Dr. Sen Gupta. Good night. Good night. Good night.